I'm here with composer Adam Schoenberg, and we're talking about his piece, Finding Rothko, which I'm performing this weekend with uh, the University of Missouri at Kansas City Symphony Orchestra, 7.30, October 15th. I'm really excited about that concert, and excited to be able to perform one of my best friend's pieces. Um, Finding Rothko is a piece that was actually originally, originally written for Michael Stern in the Iris Chamber Orchestra. So how did you get to know Michael and have this Kansas City Symphony connection? Well, I spent several summers at the Aspen Music Festival in school, first as a student and then working backstage as a stagehand, and that's when I first met Michael, and word got around that I was a tennis player and he wanted to start playing tennis, and so we spent a couple summers hitting on a court, and uh, that led to him learning that I was also a composer. And in January of 2006, we met in the Upper West Side in Manhattan at a coffee shop, and he sort of surprised me by asking if I'd like to write Iris a new piece, a 15 to 20 minute chamber orchestra piece. And so that was the initial, that was actually my very first, you know, real professional commission. And uh, Did you know right away that you were going to write the piece about uh, Rothko, or was that just uh, something that came to you in that, in that time of your life? I know you were walking through the Metropolitan Museum of Art, or was it the you know, MoMA? You, no, yeah, it, was, it was MoMA, yeah. So, so the commission came in January, and I didn't know what I wanted to, to base it on. To me, I've, I always need some type of narrative, and, and you know, I was spending lots of times, a lot of times, in, I was spending a lot of time in museums, and uh, I discovered Mark Rothko first at the MoMA, and also I saw some, uh, actually this painting was at the Guggenheim. And they immediately just seemed to offer a lot of musical narrative in them, and I thought it would be interesting to write a large-scale work based on four uh, separate paintings of Rothko. So tell us a little bit about this painting and uh, how it filtered into Finding Rothko. Well, this painting in particular I, I like because it's, it's, it sort of marks the transition of Rothko into his later period, where he's most fam you know where he's most known for, where he does more block uh, painting, where he's you know two or three rectangles with different colors, mm -hmm. and this you start to see the the different rectangles and colors emerging, but it's still even more abstract. And so, in terms of a musical piece, I thought it'd be interesting to begin a work that has less uh, solidified information, and so it, I wanted to create a more abstract, atmospheric initial movement based on the material that would later get developed. And so this painting just sort of made sense to, to, to use an earlier work of his. And as the piece progresses, uh, it was actually intuitive, but when I uh, traced the, the years, the year of each piece, uh, each uh, Rothko painting, the movement works in chronological order. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. So this is his first painting. The second movement is uh, he, uh, he created a year later, and then the last two paintings come after. So this one is called Orange. And orange begins the piece, and we hear these opening chords that are always kind of a theme that come back. Are those chords uh, in your mind? You walking, approaching this painting? Is it you as a character? Or is it the viewer, or is it just immediately um, the image? Yeah, it's honestly, it's it's actually it was more of a a compositional technique because I knew I was going to write four separate movements, and the question was, well, how are you going to link them together musically? Mm -hmm. And so I thought it would be interesting to create sort of a theme, which is Dove Rothko's theme, these three chords, and, and, and each painting, uh, each movement would, be, would begin with these three chords, and then the last movement would be the three chords fully developed. So it wasn't, you know, like Mazorsky's pic pictures where you're walking around and you're, you have the promenade, but it was, it was basically just uh, a motive, a compositional motive that would later be expanded. Great, and let's let's look at um, yellow because yellow is kind of the most uh, motion, upbeat, based movement of this. So so this is yellow, the second movement, and this is kind of the outline of the the painting. But so tell us how an image like this gets translated into the sounds that make up that movement. You know, and again, it wasn't. I wasn't trying to literally set the painting. The, the paintings themselves just, to me, provided initial inspiration. And, and and the reason why there's more motion in this particular movement is actually because I believe this painting is connected to the first painting. Where to me, this painting is is a little more developed. It's all you know came later in this period, and it it, it felt that there was even though it's actually there's less color uh, because of the red and these little streaks. I thought there was just immediate emo uh, motion. And so the first movement also introduces material that becomes the second movement, but just the second movement's faster. I see. So did, when you first saw this, obviously you talked about 
they're seeing their motion and things. But did you have a, a kind of an initial reaction to each painting that it inspired kind of the general vibe? Like, let's move on to red. Red is something that's so... Um, red is very visceral and intense. Yeah. And so because the first movement's atmospheric, the second movement is a little more positive. Yeah. And this, I, I also just in terms of the character of the entire piece, and you have to think about the overall form and how the music will unfold over time, and so it's still dramatic. And to me, because the first movement's slow and the second movement moves a little more, this, this movement's even faster and much more uh, jagged and angular and more just more aggressive in nature. And, you know, it's such a bold painting. I felt it, it was just became clear that this had to be the most intense movement. And now, talking about the final movement, wine, you, you said to me uh, earlier today that, that wine to you is the most uh, interesting painting and uh, maybe the that movement is the most uh, emotionally meaningful to you. So tell us a little bit about wine. Yeah, wine is definitely my, my favorite movement. <laughs> and also, uh, because the piece began with these three chords, it, it felt necessary at the end to use this, the, those chords as the main material. And this painting was also the hardest to come by. It's, it's, the, it's the only painting that wasn't at a museum. And I visited each painting so I could see that. And this, this is housed um, in Potomac, Maryland, um, on this gentleman's property, and I guess I believe he turned his property into a museum now as well. And so I went and visited, and just sort of had my own private viewing, and it was just this very special experience. And, and um, when you know, they, they basically opened up the museum before it was open to the public, and I, ha I walked into this room all by myself and just sat in front of the painting for oh, wow. about an hour. And, you know, if you see a Rothko painting in person, there's just something very powerful about it. And they're big. People, people sometimes oh, yeah. when they see these images, they're... your entire wall here. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very big. And, you know, musically, I wanted to write a very slow uh, and lyrical final movement that just sort of kept musically and emotionally growing. And that this image evoked that for you? Absolutely. And, and it's hard to see with these colors, but when you see it in person, the white, it really strikes you. And... I called it wine, so all the movement titles came from uh, Rothko's color palette in his titles, because most of his paintings are all untitled. Mm -hmm. It would be untitled number nine, and then in parentheses, red, white, and black. Right. And so this painting, he uses the wine. He, he says it has the color wine in it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought that was just a great, just a nice uh, description.